Welcome to the Northwestern University Rotating Resident Curriculum in the Department of Emergency Medicine. This is the Ambulatory Orthopedic Emergencies Lecture. The goals of this lecture are to learn a mnemonic to help properly describe fractures, review common causes of shoulder, wrist, knee, and ankle complaints, and discuss some serious injuries with seemingly innocuous chief complaints. As a generalist physician, it is important to be able to communicate effectively with your orthopedic colleagues. Properly describing fractures to them can improve consultation efficiency and accuracy. Eponyms or name fractures should be avoided as they may result in confusion about the specifics of the fracture. Instead, learning the language to describe the characteristics of the deformity is the best method of communication. The ABCD mnemonic can be helpful in this regard. A stands for the presence of articular involvement and degree of angulation. Articular or joint involvement of the fracture line usually portends a poorer prognosis to the fracture. Angulation refers to the distal segment being set in a different line from the proximal segment, segment measurable by an angle. Refer to the last three images on the figure for examples of angulation. B stands for the actual bone involved and blood vessel or the pulse examination. C stands for degree of comminution and whether the fracture is closed. The fracture is said to be comminuted if there are more than two pieces of bone. If the fracture is open, that means the skin is broken and the fracture is exposed to air, indicating a true orthopedic emergency. D stands for displacement and disability. Displacement refers to the degree to which the distal segment is shifted in a line parallel to the proximal segment. Refer to the first three images in the figure for examples of displacement. Disability is similar to the D in the trauma primary survey and refers to the neurologic examination. Hitting all the points in this mnemonic can help generalist physicians facilitate consultation with an orthopedist. The shoulder is a complex joint with an impressive range of motion and a number of structures which may be injured, causing pathology. To simplify the evaluation of shoulder pain, it is useful to divide the causes of shoulder pain into the anatomic structures, bone, muscle, joint, bursa, and ligament. In the evaluation of shoulder pain, always consider non-musculoskeletal causes first. Myocardial infarction, pneumonia, and pneumothorax often cause referred shoulder pain. An intra-abdominal process such as perforation and biliary colic can cause scapular and shoulder pain, usually in the setting of abdominal pain. Radiculopathy will cause shoulder pain that radiates down the arm, sometimes to the hand. Once extrinsic causes of shoulder pain are ruled out on clin clinical grounds, the intrinsic causes can be entertained. Remember the anatomic structures that make up the shoulder joint, muscle, ligament, bursa, joint, and bone. For muscle, rotator cuff injuries and tendonitis are extremely common. The major ligament of the shoulder that causes pathology when injured is the acromioclavicular ligament at the lateral margin of the clavicle. Bursitis may cause poorly localized pain on range of motion. The glenohumeral joint can be dislocated or have arthritis, as in rheumatoid, osteo, or septic, or develop adhesive capsulitis. The major bones that are fractured in the shoulder trauma are the clavicle and the humerus. Here are some very simple physical examination pearls for the non-orthopedic physician to keep in mind when examining the shoulder. The touchdown sign is an active range of motion test that can determine whether the shoulder symptom is due to an intrinsic shoulder problem or an extrinsic issue. A patient who can raise both arms above their head without any pain or limited range of motion does not likely have an intrinsic shoulder problem. Patients with normal range of motion but with pain on performing the touchdown sign likely have a muscular or bursal origin to the pain. Decreased range of motion with pain indicates a rotator cuff tear or adhesive capsulitis. When patients make limited or no effort attempts to actively move their shoulder due to pain, a more serious cause is suspected, such as fracture, dislocation, AC separation, or septic arthritis. A simple palpation scheme of the shoulder should include the clavicle, the AC joint, the SC joint or sternoclavicular joint, the bicipital groove, the humeral head in the glenoid fossa, and the C-spine. A neurovascular exam should always be performed to assess the spinal accessory nerve, deltoid skin sensation for damage to the axillary nerve seen in glenohumeral dislocations, and the radial and brachial pulses. The median nerve is tested with thumb opposition, the ulnar nerve with finger abduction, and the radial nerve with wrist extension. Direct trauma to the shoulder with a direct blow tends to cause a few characteristic injuries, including clavicle fracture, proximal humerus fracture, shoulder or glenohumeral dislocation, and shoulder or acromioclavicular separation. The clavicle is the number one most commonly broken long bone in the body. Fracture often results from a fall onto a shoulder.
Physical exam generally demonstrates pain and tenderness at the fracture line with possible visible or, even, or palpable step-off. Clavicle fractures almost never require surgery even if the displacement is significant. Treatment is supportive with a sling for four to six weeks. Humerus fractures are often seen with direct trauma to the shoulder in older individuals. Three and four part fractures usually require surgery, though rarely emergently. Proximal humerus fractures often result in radial nerve injuries causing wrist drop. The humeral head is one of the bones at risk for developing avascular necrosis when severely injured. Emergent management generally involves sling for comfort and urgent outpatient orthopedic follow-up. Shoulder or glenohumeral dislocation results from either a direct blow to the shoulder or a severe twisting or stretching mechanism. Dislocation in the anterior location is most common. Posterior dislocation can be caused by seizure and inferior dislocation by direct trauma to an arm outstretched at 180 degrees. Both are extremely rare. Patients with shoulder dislocations will be unable to touch their opposite shoulder and will generally keep their ipsilateral upper extremity adducted. The empty glenoid sign is when you attempt to palpate the humeral head in the glenoid fossa and there's no firm stop to the palpation because the humeral head is not present in its usual lo location. The axillary nerve can be compressed by the humeral head causing deltoid skin anesthesia and loss of initiation of abduction of the upper extremity. Shoulder dislocations should be emergently reduced in the ED to reduce potential neurovascular compromise. An acromioclavicular ligament tear, also known as a shoulder separation, is an extremely common injury that occurs in young patients who fall on their shoulder. They exhibit tenderness around the acromion and lateral clavicle. In the x-ray shown below, the left image is a normal AC joint. The right image shows a clavicle which is superiorly and medially displaced relative to the acromion. There are several grades of AC separations not relevant to our discussion here, but most importantly, most will heal without surgery. Emergent management is similar to that of for clavicle fracture, sling for four to six weeks, and orthopedic follow-up. Overall prognosis is excellent. The evaluation of shoulder pain without direct trauma includes the following conditions. Rotator cuff tear or tendonitis, bicipital tendonitis, adhesive capsulitis, osteoarthritis, and septic arthritis. Remember always the extrinsic causes in your evaluation of non-traumatic shoulder pain, MI, pneumothorax, pneumonia, cervical radiculopathy, and intra-abdominal processes. The rotator cuff is a group of four muscles in the shoulder which control upper extremity function. The supraspinatus is the most commonly injured and its primary action is to abduct the arm from 30 degrees to 90 degrees. The infraspinatus and teres minor cause external rotation and the subscapularis causes internal rotation. The rotator cuff muscles are usually injured with forceful twisting or stretching mechanisms or with overuse. Pain without decreased range of motion is consistent with tendonitis. Pain with decreased range of motion is more consistent with a rotator cuff tear. While provocative physical exam tests can be used to assess which specific muscle is injured, emergent management does not change regardless of the specific injury and the diagnosis cannot be definitively made without MRI. Management in the ED for tendonitis and tears involves pain and inflammation control, sling for comfort, and outpatient orthopedic follow-up. Bicipital tendonitis generally occurs with overuse. The long head of the biceps in the anterior shoulder becomes painful and tender to palpation. Speeds test can be suggestive of bicipital tendonitis. It involves pain on palpation at the bicipital groove while the patient is elevating the supinated arm against resistance. Treatment is similar to rotator cuff tendonitis, sling for comfort, orthopedic follow-up, and pain and inflammation control. Adhesive capsulitis, or frozen shoulder, occurs in patients who have prolonged immobility such as a prior injury or sling use. Inflexible fibrous bands form around the joint which impair motion. The main symptom is stiffness and limited range of motion rather than severe pain. Prevention of adhesive capsulitis is extremely important. Any patient who is prescribed a sling for prolonged periods of time should be instructed to perform gentle range of motion exercises of the shoulder to prevent this complication. Once adhesive capsulitis has developed, treatment is physical therapy, range of motion exercises, and sometimes surgery as needed to incise the fibrous bands. Arthritis is another important cause of atraumatic shoulder pain. Osteoarthritis has pain on movement without an actual decrease in range of motion. X-rays are suggestive but not diagnostic and the clinical course is chronic. 
Patients with septic arthritis have extreme pain on range of motion and palpation. Most will not even attempt range of motion when instructed to do so. Local instrumentation and immune compromised state are important risk factors. The management of septic arthritis mandates intravenous antibiotics and orthopedic consultation for joint aspiration and likely operative irrigation. Plain radiographs of the shoulder are generally indicated in all traumatic cases and in selected atraumatic cases. A complete shoulder series should include the AP, lateral, and one view to assess the glenoid fossa, such as the axillary Y view. Like the shoulder, the knee is a complex joint which can be injured in a variety of ways. If we remember the anatomic structures that are prone to damage, we can remember the specific injuries much more easily. Knee pain can be divided roughly into location. Medially, or the left side of this image, pain indicates a medial meniscus tear, anserine bursitis, or an MCL injury. Laterally, or on the right side of the image, pain indicates an LCL injury, or iliotibial band syndrome. Anteriorly, coming out of the screen, no major ligaments are present, and the causes of pain are usually muscular, such as a quadriceps injury, tendinous, such as patellofemoral syndrome or patellar tendinitis, or bursal, as in pre-patellar bursitis. Poorly localized pain can signify an arthritis, an ACL injury, a ruptured Baker's cyst, dislocation, or tibial plateau fracture. The next slide summarizes this information. Most non-emergent causes of knee pain can be evaluated in the outpatient setting with physical examination and MRI. We will discuss some of these conditions, but focus more on when emergent evaluation and management is needed. The McMurray test is used to evaluate injury to the medial meniscus. Palpation of the medial joint line will elicit pain as the foot is rotated clockwise and counterclockwise in patients who have a medial meniscus tear. The Lachman test is considered to be more accurate than the anterior drawer test previously used for detecting ACL injuries. The hands of the examiner are pl placed just proximal and distal to the patella and joint lines. The proximal hand is held firmly as the distal hand tugs anteriorly on the tibia to detect any increased laxity relative to the other side. The tendinous and bursal origins of knee pain are usually from overuse or trauma and treatment generally involves rest, ice, and NSAID therapy. Anserine bursitis occurs in the medial aspect of the knee just distal to the joint line, i.e. overlying the tibia. Iliotibial band syndrome occurs in the lateral aspect of the knee just proximal to the joint line, i.e. overlying the femur. Prepatellar bursitis and patellofemoral syndrome both cause pain directly over the patella. On the left is a picture of the right knee with the finger marking where the anserine bursa is located. On the right is a picture of the right knee showing where the iliotibial band is located. Remember, the anserine bursa is on the medial aspect of the knee, whereas the iliotibial band is on the lateral aspect. X-rays of the knee should be obtained in most cases of direct trauma to the knee. The Ottawa knee rules are validated clinical guidelines to help determine the need for an X-ray. Patients less than 55 with the absence of patellar or fibular head tenderness who are able to flex the knee at 90 degrees and who are able to bear weight immediately and in the ED do not require emergent knee x-rays. Knee MRI in the outpatient setting is much more helpful for making that diagnosis compared with plain radiographs which are usually normal. Up to now we have discussed the less serious knee complaints, but let us focus on three specific serious knee injuries. The anterior cruciate ligament can be acutely ruptured in twisting knee injuries. It is the number one cause of acute knee effusion after injury. The ACL is a necessary ligament for pivoting and twisting movements of the knee and must be surgically repaired in patients with active lifestyles to avoid further injury to the other knee structures. Diagnosis is suspected by a positive Lachman on physical exam and confirmed by MRI. However, in patients with acute knee injuries and a large knee effusion, the Lachman tests may be equivocal or normal. This is a crucial point and patients should always be cautioned to follow up appropriately rather than to simply assume that a serious ligamentous injury is not present based on physical exam. Acute management involves rest, ice, compression, NSAIDs, and weight bearing is tolerated. Patients with direct trauma to the knee may suffer a tibial plateau fracture signaled by tenderness in the proximal anterior tibia rather than femur or patella. The sensitivity of plain radiographs in diagnosing tibial plateau fracture may be as low as 
Therefore, CT is indicated in cases where plateau fracture is strongly suspected, even in cases of negative radi radiographs. Surgical management may eventually be necessary, but acute management in the ED involves non-weight bearing with crutches and a knee immobilizer. Knee dislocation is much more serious than simple patellar dislocation. Knee dislocation involves rupture of most or all of the ligaments of the knee, resulting in disarticulation of the femur and tibia. The two bones may spontaneously relocate and be held in place by the strong musculature of the lower extremity, making it appear as if there has not been significant damage to the knee. Simple physical exam will demonstrate significant instability in all directions when the knee is stressed. Patients with knee dislocation are at risk for popliteal injury, so a careful neurovascular exam is mandatory in these patients. Angiogram of the popliteal artery should be strongly considered in such patients, and orthopedic consultation is mandatory. This x-ray shows a radiographically obvious lateral tibial plateau fracture. Always remember that tibial plateau fractures have a high rate of false negative x-rays and strong clinical suspicion should mandate CT evaluation or complete immobilization and repeat x-rays at a follow-up visit. This x-ray demonstrates a knee dislocation with the tibia dislocated anteriorly relative to the femur. Popliteal artery injury is an important potential complication of this significant injury and consideration should be given to obtaining an angiogram for evaluation. The ankle joint is bounded by the distal fibula laterally, the distal tibia medially, and the talus inferiorly. The joint space between the fibula, tibia, and talus is also known as the mortise joint. Ankle inversion and eversion injuries most commonly result in sprains or tears in the ligaments, but fractures can also occur, especially medially, where the deltoid ligament is extremely strong. The following is a basic palpation exam for ankle injuries that will identify the most common areas of damage. Examine the entire length of the fibula, especially the lateral malleolus, the most distal part, and the most proximal part near the knee at the fibular head. The most distal part of the tibia, also known as the medial malleolus, should also be examined. Then palpate the base of the fifth metatarsal of the foot, as fractures here are very common. Palpate the calcaneus carefully. And lastly, examine the strength and integrity of the Achilles tendon, which can be ruptured in direct trauma or forceful step-offs when initiating a sprint. Ankle pain most commonly results from acute injury due to inversion or eversion mechanisms. The top image depicts the lateral view of the ankle. Lateral ankle sprains are extremely common as inversion of the ankle occurs much more frequently than eversion. The lateral ankle ligaments are usually injured in the following order. First, the ATFL, or anterior talofibular ligament, then the CFL, or calcaneofibular ligament, and following that, the PTFL, or the posterior talofibular ligament. Medially, the deltoid ligament is extremely strong and eversion injuries may result in the tip of the medial malleolus actually being avulsed rather than direct damage to the deltoid ligament. The syndesmotic sprain of the ankle, also known as a high ankle sprain, involves rupture of the AIFTL followed by a tear in the inner osseous ligament between the tibia and the fibula. This results in a more serious injury than a lateral or medial ankle sprain and will be discussed further. The Ottawa ankle rules are one example of a clinical decision guideline on when to obtain x-rays. As with every clinical guideline, they should be used in the setting of proper clinical judgment by the treating healthcare provider. Ankle x-rays may be avoided if all of the following clinical criteria are met. The patient's age is greater than 55. There is no tenderness to palpation in the posterior half of the distal 6 centimeters of the tibia or the fibula. They have no tenderness to palpation in the, in the navicular bone, and they are able to bear weight immediately after the injury and in the ED for four steps. If the patient doesn't meet all these criteria and they have ankle pain or tenderness to palpation, then they should have an x-ray to evaluate for fracture or joint instability. In general, ankle sprains are managed conservatively. Rest, ice, compression, and elevation is universally accepted to help reduce inflammation. NSAIDs have been shown to be more effective than placebo and have the theoretical advantage over acetaminophen of being an anti-inflammatory, but have not been tested head-to-head -head against acetaminophen in a clinical trial. The air cast brace shown on the right is more effective than an ACE wrap because it immobilizes the ankle effectively to prevent inversion and eversion, but allows excellent plantar and dorsiflexion to maintain range of motion. Range of motion exercises such as tracing letters with the great toe can be initiated on day one of injury and may speed healing and earlier return of flexibility in the ankle.
Serious ankle injuries can result from inversion or eversion mechanisms. Medial or lateral malleolar fractures can occur, causing instability in the mortis joint. These fractures may require surgery if stress views of the ankle demonstrate widening between the bones, indicating significant ligamentous injury in addition to the bony fractures. A syndesmotic sprain, or high ankle sprain, refers to damage of the tibiofibular ligaments as well as of the interosseous membrane connecting the two bones. It is an important cause of chronic ankle pain and instability. The squeeze test involves squeezing the distal leg. If there is pain anterior to the lateral malleolus, a syndesmotic sprain is suspected. Unlike ordinary ankle sprains, orthopedic evaluation is mandatory for syndesmotic sprains as surgery may prevent chronic ankle pain and instability. The image on the left demonstrates a normal ankle joint. Note the symmetric spacing between the tibia and talus and fibula and talus. In the image on the right, note that there is a widened gap between the tibia and the talus and a narrow gap between the fibula and talus. The image on the right indicates an unstable ankle that must be immobilized and may be a candidate for surgical repair. The Maisonneuve fracture is a specific fracture which requires careful evaluation of the proximal fibula. An eversion or external rotation injury is the usual mechanism, causing medial ankle pain and tenderness. Ankle radiographs show a medial malleolar fracture, and tibulofibular radiographs demonstrate a proximal fibular fracture as the energy from the injury travels up the interosseous membrane and disrupts the fibular head. Patients with Maisonneuve fractures must be immobilized immediately and may require non-emergent operative repair of the syndesmosis tear. The fibular head fracture is merely a sign of interosseous ligament injury and requires no specific management. The base of the fifth metatarsal can be fractured in patients with ankle inversion injuries. There are two main types of fractures, the Jones and Pseudo-Jones fractures. The Jones fracture is the more serious of the two. It involves the more distal part of the fifth metatarsal at the metaphysis or diaphysis. The Jones fracture requires total immobilization of the foot and ankle with a posterior mold splint and non-weight bearing until seen by the orthopedist. The pseudo-Jones fracture involves the epiphysis of the fifth metatarsal more proximally and is far less significant. Weight bearing is tolerated with a hard-soled cast shoe is sufficient and surgical management is rarely if ever needed. Calcaneal fracture is an important injury that can occur from landing on the feet from a height. X-rays can be negative in up to 20% of cases, so when clinical suspicion is high, CT scan should be performed to assess for fracture. The lumbar spine vertebrae may also be fractured with the same mechanism, so careful physical examination of the lower back is essential and imaging should be performed for either back pain or tenderness to palpation. Fouche injuries are so named for falls on outstretched hand. Any bone in the upper extremity from the humerus to the distal phalanges can be injured in this mechanism, so physical examination should be tailored accordingly. Wrist and forearm injuries are the most common, especially distal radius and carpal bone fractures. The scaphoid is a bone that is prone to injury with a Fouche mechanism. Scaphoid fracture is suspected when there is tenderness to palpation over the anatomic snuff box, the area marked with the arrow in the top image between the extensor pollicis longus ulnarly and the extensor pollicis brevis radially. Radiographs are often negative in cases of subsequently proven scaphoid fracture, so patients with tenderness to palpation in the anatomic snuff box should always be immobilized with a thumb spica splint and sent for follow-up radiographs in one week. Inadequate immobilization of occult scaphoid fractures can result in avascular necrosis of the scaphoid, causing loss of thumb range of motion, a devastating complication. In summary, use the ABCD mnemonic to help consultations. Angulation and articular, bone and blood vessel, comminution and closed, displacement and disability. Review the anatomy of the joints and think of the bones, muscles, ligaments, and the joint itself that can be injured. For shoulder pain, always consider extrinsic causes of pain first, especially in non-traumatic cases. For knee and ankle pain, use the Ottawa rules to reduce unnecessary x-rays, but understand that the sensitivity is not 100% and clinical judgment should always be paramount. When clinical suspicion is high enough for a fracture and the x-ray is negative, immobilize the affected extremity anyway and establish a follow-up plan for repeat x-rays and orthopedic evaluation. This rule is especially important for evaluation of the scaphoid, tibial plateau, and calcaneus, where occult fractures are common and missed injuries can be devastating.